All right, this episode is the bench press master class. Everything you need to know about the bench press, how to get a bigger bench, the muscles they develop, uh, why you can't bench very well, why you hurt, what's going on. Let's talk about one of the most popular exercises yeah. in gyms across the world. The gold standard uh, is whether or not you're strong. That's what it used to be, right? Let's go. When we were kids, yeah, yeah. it was all about How much that. you bench? Yeah. That was terrible, man. Yeah, this, that was this has to be this has to be my worst lift of the big ones originally. I yeah, was, well, you're tall, long arms, yeah. the leverage. Yeah. You know, it's it's a it, it's up there, uh, always among the top, like four or five exercises, I would say. Um, and I would argue it belongs there. Um, I don't think it's one or two, but I think it's 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 definitely a good upper body exercise. Yeah, and because uh, it is it's functional uh, in in the strength that it. It provides and it builds and it's a phenomenal exercise for developing like the pushing muscles of the upper body, the chest, the shoulders, and the triceps. You get really good at a bench press and all of those muscles are going to get pretty well developed. It's a, it's pretty incredible at, at its ability to do so. So it's, it's a good exercise. Uh, it's part say. of the big five, but it's the last one of the big five yeah, in my opinion. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I think tremendous value. All right. Today's program giveaway is MAPS Powerlift. Here's how you can win that program. Leave a comment below this video, the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comment section. We're also running a 50% off sale right now. MAPS Starter, our beginner strength training program, is half off. And then we have a bundle that includes MAPS Anabolic and MAPS Prime. That's also 50% off. You can find both if you click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here comes the show. Um, do you want to start this by talking about a lot of the issues or things that hold people back from having a successful bench press first before we get into all the techniques and tips? Yeah, I think maybe we should talk about like the requirements, right? Like like the things that you need, uh, that your body needs to be able to perform uh, a bench press well. And then that could lead us directly to kind of what you're talking about. Yeah. You need to have, uh, I guess the, the first thing would be like a stable shoulder girdle. Right, so the shoulder girdle is the shoulder joint plus the scapula. It's kind of that whole area it needs to be pretty stable. If it's not stable and you do a lot of bench press or you start adding weight to the bench press, then you run into um, a lot of problems. In fact, I would say the bench press is of all the strength training exercises has to be one of the most likely to cause shoulder injuries in people because they don't necessarily enter into it with good like shoulder, you know, girdle stability. Yeah, it exposes any kind of uh, weak point in terms of like you being able to track and maintain uh, your shoulder in that position and have it stable while you're loading it so substantially. Okay, so that's going to go over the head of a lot of people. So what, yeah. do, what do we mean by, how does somebody know that they have a stable shoulder girdle or not? Well, like what, yep. what are the key indicators that... I need to improve that, and what does that even mean? To I me? think the easiest way to communicate that would be to communicate really good bench press form first. Mm -hmm. So when you when you're bench pressing in a safe and effective way, which also is the way you'll also be able to lift the most amount of weight, by the way, uh, because it allows for um, the best recruitment pattern and the best leverage. It's a it's a high chest, so you stick out your chest, and your shoulder blades are pulled back and down back and, and down. locked in that position. So your shoulder blades aren't rolling forward while you're benching and trying to get the, the, the weight up. You're in this kind of high tight position, shoulders back, but down also not hiked up. And this puts you in a very safe type position. But in order to maintain that position while lifting a bar off your chest, the muscles that hold that position have to be strong. Yeah. That's what I mean by shoulder girdle, I guess, stability. Yeah, and, and really with the bench, we're trying to get as expansive as we can to allow the chest to really uh, work uh, and the pectoralis to, to be to be able to contribute a, as much as possible and not bear the the load so much on on the shoulders. And that's a lot of times that's where we get a lot of um, you know potential injury. So it helps to understand why this is such a challenge for, for most people, right? So like if I were to stand up right now and shove Justin as hard as I could. Bad idea, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> He's tried one time. Yeah. <laughs> big mistake. What would happen, is, it, it, naturally, you would see yourself do this. Yeah, you're rolling like, everything you, forward. You would just roll everything forward. So it's, it's natural for us 
to 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 kind of roll the shoulders forward in this pushing motion. But for a uh, more optimal bench press for building your pecs, for building your chest, you got to be able to keep your shoulders in that retracted position. Anchored. Yeah, yes. anchored down. And it's Into just, it's unnatural. Because like I said, if you were to get up and just push somebody, mm -hmm. you wouldn't do that. It would, mm -hmm. it would flop forward. Yet, when you teach somebody a proper bench press, they're in that role position. Then you add the problem that we have is that, not a problem, but just what we do all day long is everything is in front of us, right? So when we, uh, you drive, you brush your teeth, you eat, everything, you no, yeah, nobody, nobody does anything back here, right? So you're, you're constantly tightening and shortening all of these muscles up here that, that force you to already be in this rounded position. So not only is it uh, natural for you to roll forward when you were to shove or push something, but then you're already in that advantageous position for rounding okay so we have to find a way to teach somebody to get in that position and then be able to hold that position and then be stable and strong in it and it's just it's probably in my opinion i know a lot of people think that like the deadlift is like one of the hardest things to teach a client teaching a lot of clients to bench press really well it's a very technical exercise i'm so very, glad you said that very very everything's te everybody thinks it's basic yeah it's very technical uh movement your low back is off the not your butt your low back is arched your shoulders are pinned down and back and stable and there's a technique uh, to the you have to have first of all you have to have a strong mid back in order to have a safe, strong bench press. You think, what does the back have to do with anything? Right. The back is what's stabilizing your shoulder girdle, your scapula. It's what keeps you in that safe position because the shoulder joint is very complex. It's a very mm -hmm. complex joint. It's not just the arm that's moving up and down. The shoulder blade also moves along with us. Now, and, and the humerus is like floating. Right, <laughs> right. So, it could twist and do all. And, and now, evolutionarily speaking, they think that the reason why we have such, uh, you know, I guess technical or advanced or complex shoulder joints is because we throw with accuracy, right? It's this really amazing joint that allows us to throw with accuracy. But with, in a bench press, you don't want 50 million moving parts floating around. You want everything stable as possible and you want to generate power and kind of this, you know, almost straight line, not quite straight line, but in this, you know, linear fashion to keep everything really stable. You need to have a strong, stable mid back for this. In fact, oftentimes people's bench press suffer because their back is weak. Their mid back is weak. They yeah. don't have a good, uh, you know, rhomboid strength and lower trapezius strength. Then you have the muscles that rotate the the upper arm, the ones that per, that cause you to be able to rotate the arm and stabilize the humerus. Those are smaller muscles, uh, you know, like your your supraspinatus, infraspinatus, the teres minor, subscapularis, like all these muscles that are on the. You know, when you hear someone say they injured their rotator cuff, the rotator cuff literally is like the the part of the sh the, the shoulder blade that all these muscles attach to. So when someone says oh, I, I tore my rotator cuff, you can actually ask the question, which muscle, which one got injured? Because there's so many that attach there. So you need those strong stabilizers to keep your upper arm from twisting and doing weird things when you're trying to bench press. Here's a hot take for you. There's more shitty bench pressing happening right now than deadlifting. Probably. And I'll tell you the reason why. One, most people that are afraid of doing a deadlift are afraid of doing it. So they they're way it. more cautious. They're way more cautious. They avoid it in the first place. If you have shitty deadlift form, it is very obvious, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, which is why a lot of people won't do it unless they feel confident. I remember being a trainer and not deadlifting because I was self-conscious of not doing it well. So I avoid it. But bench press is actually really difficult to see somebody who's bench pressing bad if you're not if you don't know what you're looking yeah, for. You're I can, yeah, yeah, I can totally get on board with that because it's not as respected, uh, and, and that's one of those things you'll get from your doctor, your physician, like avoid deadlifts, so it'll hurt your back. Like there's all this misinformation deadlift wise, where I think too people are a bit apprehensive towards that, but nobody considers like technique is. Uh, crucial for for bench pressing, especially when you start getting into maximal load. Yeah, it's it's again, it's a technical exercise. It's a very effective exercise, though, when you do it right. If you um, you know you treat it uh, with respect, it can be incredible. And a lot of that has to do with making sure your mid back is strong, your positioning is good, and you've got healthy stabilizers uh, in your like your like I said, the ones that attach to the rotator cuff. How do we do that? Um, well, um, you can prime properly. We can get into that. And then there's exercises you could do.
that help with that. But priming is a way to wake these muscles up and also allow yourself to connect to the muscles that you need to, to provide you with a, a kind of stable position. A very, this is funny because it sounds like, you know, if I, what, I'm, what I'm about to say, everybody's like, well, I know that exercise. One of the best ways to prime your bench press is to do some rows before you bench press. Band rows are my favorite for this. Mm -hmm. Band rows, they emphasize the squeeze because the band gets harder as you stretch it out. It's not so heavy to where you might have bad technique, but doing some band rows where you really squeeze the shoulder blades back and down, doing a couple sets of that before you bench press. Uh, I use that with almost all my clients because it would almost always improve their technique and form uh, when they bench press. One of my yeah. favorites. It, I, I like isometric stuff too mm -hmm. for that, right? So like zone one, uh, the isometric uh, hold against the wall or what I'll do, like if I don't have a, a band, because I think bands are phenomenal too. Uh, I would like, I would carry bands with me normally and have them in my bag. If I don't have that, I'll actually get over in a bit over row position and hold an isometric hold in the in the row position mm -hmm. for my mid back. So I'll just bring the bar that's really light for me to do that, right? And yeah, so it's not a workout, by the way. Yeah, yeah. You're just you, trying to activate. That's right. You don't want to get fatigue. You don't want to fatigue you, or else that will hinder how much you can lift on the bench. The idea is just to prime, wake all those muscles up because you're trying to help them stay active when you are getting into the bench. Yeah, press. you know what's funny is uh, you know talk about like um, old wisdom or bro science. I remember um, learning it's like bench press technique from some older lifters. And now they didn't communicate it like we are, right? Because they don't think they understood why it worked. They just showed me one of the ways that they set their bench press up. And what they would do is they would get under the bar of the bench press and they would use, they would do like an inverted row with the bar uh, from the bench press. So they'd get underneath it and then they'd pull their chest up to the bar yeah. and do some reps squeezing back. And then they'd get into position and bench. And I remember not understanding like why he did it, but he's like, right. Oh, he's like, Oh, when I do this, I could bench more. He was literally priming his mid-back. It was intuitive. It yeah, was intuitive. It, it's one of those, I do the same thing, not knowing what I know now, uh, in terms of, you know, the significance of that, but it's really to activate those, those muscles that are going to keep you, uh, anchored there to the bench to keep everything in contrast to what you're doing in terms of like pressing outward. We want to stay as stable. The thing about like physics and leverage and all this kind of stuff, it's like, if you think about a, a less stable, uh, body in this position. If I have any kind of movement left to right, if I'm loose at all, yeah, if you're in a waterbed, yeah, exactly. <laughs> how how efficient are you going to be lifting something on a waterbed? Right, that's a great example. It's it's all about uh, efficiency and effectiveness. So the more tense and rigid I could. Uh, uh, make my body and create that sort of like anchoring all the way from, you know, my shoulders all the way down, even through my feet, uh, which is something I learned way later on in terms of leg drive, incorporating that into the bench, you get so much more output. Yeah. I love when we talk about things that take me back and remind me of like a like moment. Yeah, exactly. That like there was this, this moment in my, my training career where like this light bulb really went off for me. So for, we've talked about this for many years, uh, most of us, and definitely me, maybe not Justin as much, but for sure, Sal and I did a lot of the, the bro, you know, single body part stuff, of right? Course. Like arm day, chest day, back day, leg day. And the theory then is that like, I, if I'm just focused on one muscle, I can give it all to that. I'll get the most out of that muscle because I'm focused just on that muscle. And so I always thought that it was the superior way of training. And I remember this is years into already being a trainer and I was still training this way. And my buddy who is doing a, uh, you know, push pull type of routine and he's doing a back routine first fall by chest. And I remember thinking like, that's a stupid idea. You're going to be so exhausted yeah. from your back exercises. By the time you get to chest, you're going to be so weak. Yeah. And I followed it with him. I hit a PR and that, that was the moment for me that I went, holy shit. I know I'm tired from all those back exercises we did, but I just hit a PR on chest from doing that, and it, I realized how important it was for me to get in that stable, rigid, get those muscles all activated so that when I went into the bench press, I could get everything out of that movement. And that was like such an aha moment for me that I could exhaust myself in these other uh, back exercises and be stronger going to chest than me be going yeah. fresh into my chest. Like that was so mind blowing. People, so people might argue like, what are you talking about? Like you, you made your back tired. How are you able to use your mid back muscles to stabilize you better? It's not that he he they were dead before and he had to wake them up. What happens is you he's able to feel 
those muscles because he just worked them out. So now when he gets in the bench press, he can put they himself on better. Yes. So as trainers, we used to do this with clients where if I was trying to get them to activate a muscle, sometimes what all I would have to do is touch it. I put my finger on it and be like right here, squeeze right here. And then, Oh, there it is. Now I can feel it. And that's hard to do with the back for a lot of people, especially when you're pushing, mm -hmm. how do I activate my back while I push? Doesn't my back want to pull? So that's exactly what you notice. Yeah. So either, even though you were more tired, you were able to activate those muscles and, and give yourself a more solid, stable base. Another priming movement I love that primes the rotator muscles really well uh, without you having to focus on exactly what you're doing necessarily is our shoulder dislocates. Mm -hmm. Shoulder dislocates are excellent. All you need is a stick. A broomstick would work or a, a PVC pipe or a lot of gyms now have them, just a, a stick. And that allows your rotator muscles to kind of warm up and activate and you can feel how you need to move your shoulder. And it's a great way to quote unquote warm up before bench press, especially if you tend to have shoulder pain in the back of the shoulder or the top of the shoulder when you're bench pressing. It's one of my favorites. We have videos for that. Obviously there's techniques that to, to consider while doing that, uh, grabbing it as wide as you can to start, uh, pulling outward to create tension. Yeah. So this is all important things and also not allowing your back to, to arch substantially, um, just to make sure that, um, you know, you're performing that at, at a high level, but yes, it's going to go ahead and, and wake up and prime and, and activate a lot of those rotational muscles that are there around the shoulder that will help to contribute, keeping it in place, keeping it in that track. The, 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 the more we can keep it in place, the more effective the lift's going to be. Yeah. You mentioned earlier too, leg drive. So, and, and Adam, you're talking about aha moments. Boy, that was that a huge one for me. I always heard power lifters talk about leg drive when they would bench press and it never made any sense to me. What the hell do the legs have to do with the bench yeah, press? Right. They don't do anything. I, like, I could push all I want off the floor. So I lift the bar. I have to use my arms. It made no sense to me whatsoever. Then I had this, this guy working out who explained it to me. And he said, look, and this is an example I've used on the show. He said, squeeze your right hand as hard as you can, but relax every muscle in your body, including your face. So you're not allowed to tense any of the muscle, but just squeeze your right hand as hard as you could. And then he said, now squeeze your right hand and squeeze the rest of your body. Yeah. Which, which one are you able to generate more force with? And I was like, oh... That's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Why does that happen? The central nervous system can fire more effectively when it's firing throughout the body versus just in an isolated place. So if I bench press and my legs are just hanging off the bench and my feet are on the floor, I can't press as hard as when I'm driving my legs into the floor, tightening my glutes and literally activating the lower half of my body. Power lifters have known this for decades. So leg drive is what they call it is very important in creating an effective uh, bench press. So yep. not only that, but then you also get the other factor of because you're so locked in tight and everything's firing, you're rigid and there's no leak in power. Yeah. And back to like the, your, and Justin loves to talk about this with like the shoulders, you know, that was another big aha moment for me was learning how to prime my shoulders and get them very, all the muscles around the shoulder to be primed, warmed up and, and stable so that when I go to press, there's not any of this, yeah. you know, floppiness or movement in the shoulder. If you're going to lift really heavy weight, you're braced with your legs, you're braced with your core, you're in that position. And then the, the, there's this movement in the shoulder as any you go, movement. because it's not stable and locked in and rigid, you're leaking power. And when you're making it, when you're doing a movement, that big with that much potential weight on it, it could be the difference of like 25, 50 plus pounds mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. your body can load more just by being able to be primed, warmed up and stable in order to do that lift. That was a huge one for me yeah. was, was piecing that together and really noticing that like, wow, when I do all these rotator cuffs or wall circles or zone one really get, I love W's on the, um, on the suspension trainer, yeah, mm -hmm. like that movement just kind of primes and wakes all those up. I'm so rigid and stable to bench press. All right. One more thing with technique is a good, there's now there's different bench press forms and techniques. And yes, they all have some value, but generally speaking for most people, you want to have a, a form where your elbows are not completely flared out and obviously, and also not completely by your sides. You want them slightly tucked. Okay. So you've got this kind of slightly tucked shoulder position as you're pressing that maximizes leverage and it minimizes uh, risk of injury. Elbows flared way out. Sometimes you'll see bodybuilders do this. That can maximize maybe chest involvement, 
but the risk of injury goes through the roof with that position. And I would say until you are a master at bench press, you've got good stable shoulders, you know how to perform it really well, I would not mess with those different varieties and versions. Like if I take somebody who's really learning technique on the bench press and then I haven't flared their elbows out, I've just increased the risk of potential injury by, you know, by twice, by double, right? So you want that kind of slightly elbow tuck position. People always ask to hand like grip positioning, right? You want your hands outside your shoulders. You don't want them super wide and you also don't want them too close together. That's a different exercise. Well, I think an exercise. easy way to teach it is that when you bring your elbows down, you've made a 90 degree angle. Yeah. This is the position where your right? hands so should, you be. should have this nice in your, in your elbow, you should have this nice 90 degree. And, yeah. and by the way, that doesn't mean that you can't ever do a bench press like this, that you right. can't ever do a bench press like there's like, but for a, standard like teaching consistency yeah basic you know bench press what does it look like to get ready for it is if i take the bar take no weight on it or a stick just so you can see it and i bring it down you know if my hands are out here i got that huge angle if my mm -hmm. hands are way in here i want to be right at 90 degrees when i'm looking at it and that's yeah like, and i mean the the barbells have uh definitely designed these like knurled and this etching in there for you to kind of line up your hands yeah. and to make sure that your thumb is sort of outside and you know, it's it's somewhat of a generalized starting point, at least for you to to experiment with. You know, widen it out a little bit, but again, it's not going to be too far away from what that's already uh, designed. Yeah, for. The, I like the standardized lines because most barbells will have a line right around the same place. Once you kind of figure out your grip, yeah, what finger goes on that? Yeah, so yeah. like if a taller guy, it's gonna be a little right. different than a shorter guy, but you kind of know where your hand goes, and you know your hands are even on the bar. This is important because, by the way, the reason why those lines exist in the first place is because if you're too far to the right or the left, obviously the leverage yeah. changes, <laughs> and you've you're, made it, you're in trouble. Yeah, you've made it a, a dangerous exercise. Um, you also want your reps to be controlled with the bench press. There is a tendency with the bench press to do to want to do two things. Either one, rebound off the chest a little bit, so come down to the chest, bounce and come up, or two, not completely finish the rep at the top and you kind of see these half like not full extension type reps. I if you want a really good bench press that's really effective across the board, you want to come all the way down to the chest touch the chest, but don't rest on the chest, mm -hmm. then press all the way up to your arms are fully extended in a controlled fashion, meaning it's there's no bouncing or jerking. It's a very controlled type of repetition. This is the mu must yep. way. If you're coaching training, this is the must way to teach first. It doesn't mean that those two other ways that you just suggested or talked about doesn't have value or you can't do right. an explosive... Sure. But it's like ignore any coaches or trainers that are suggesting that as a way for you to get, get good at the bench press, yeah. taking it through its full controlled range of motion, get very good at that, get very strong at that. And then when you get into advanced techniques, you can start to play with shortening reps up to increase the tension on Cheat the chest. Reps. Yeah, explosive, explosive stuff where you're using momentum to help you out. But when you're learning that movement, uh, doing advanced techniques that somebody might have taught you or showed you, is, to me, has little to no value and or carries a lot of risk with it. Yeah, you know, here's an area people never talk about is the grip on the bar uh, when you're bench pressing. Uh, because oh, you're false grip. Yeah, because you're pushing the bar, people tend to not focus on the grip. You want the bar to sit uh, in the palm of your hand here, not too far up on your hand because that'll cause wrist issues. But you want to also be able to do so with your thumb wrapped around the bar. This is the best way to learn how to bench press. And trust me, when you get good at it with this, you're going to be totally fine. Some people will do what's called a false grip. Um, I don't ever teach that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you're super advanced and you know how to do it right and whatever, fine. But I've seen way too many people start to lose it on a bench press and lose the bar. And you're under the bar <laughs> that you yeah. lose. Not a good idea. And it doesn't make you bench more by having a false grip. It doesn't really contribute to anything other than maybe someone learned that way and that's how they felt most comfortable. So thumb around the bar and squeeze the bar. Yeah, squeeze again, bar. you know, to to your point of like going full range of motion and making sure like, you know, you teach that that technique first, like and we can get to yes. all these other nuances of like how to, um, uh, you know, address some of those things. But like, yeah, you'll see see guys where their their wrists are are broken and and they're doing the false grip like i've i've just always whenever you you're grabbing a, a barbell you want to make a nice tight fist so it's supporting your wrists and so to, to be able to wrap that thumb all the way around to grip it really tight mm -hmm. um and create even create a little bit more force and tension through the muscles by squeezing a little bit harder 
uh, may even contribute towards your overall performance, but it's protective for the wrist. The wrists are very exposed in the bench press. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right. Now there are exercises uh, that, um, oh, by the way, I want to go over this as well. Frequency. Bench press is an awesome exercise because it's one of those that you could do quite frequently. Mm -hmm. You could bench press, I mean, three days a week you could bench press and get phenomenal results. Now, I wouldn't say you bench press heavy and hard three days a week, but you could bench press three days a week. You can't really say that about every exercise. But with the bench press, it seems to be true. Most people, in my experience, do better with the bench press if they do it more frequently than they do it less frequently. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that look like? There's typically one heavy day. Yeah. In there, there's you're, typically you're not maxing out every single time. Yeah, there's another day where you may be higher reps, and maybe another day where you're 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 just perfecting technique. But the practice of the bench press, the frequency, seems to work uh, very well. Yeah, I like I like having a day that is really heavy, a day that is really light and speed, and then another day that's kind of like mild hypertrophy pump type yeah. of like day. Like those three, I think work really well. And then you again, spread them out based off of how your body feels, but that's kind of a good standard way to like increase your bench press is lifting three times a week, modifying the intensity. One of the ways to modify the intensity is by lightening the load, doing one day that's like speed technique day. And then another day that's more of like feeling the muscle and pumping. And then one day of the right. getting after it, trying to really load it. Uh, yeah, I agreed. Um, now there's, there's ex lots of different exercises will uh, help contribute to the strength of the bench press. But there's a there's a few that seem to have the most carryover with most for most people. One of them is the overhead press. Um, so this is more true for someone, let's say been bench pressing for a couple of years, they kind of get stuck. Sometimes getting better at other exercises will get the bench press uh, better. And overhead press is one of those movements where if my overhead press goes up, my bench press almost always also goes up. It's mm -hmm. almost never the case where my overhead press goes up and my bench press doesn't see uh, an improvement. In that same kind of vein, I would say, because uh, people think bench press and they think flat barbell bench press. That's what they think, right? And I think that one of the most neglected exercises is an incline bench press. Yeah. I just think that I, I did for years and so did all my friends, like, because we were weaker at the incline press. And nobody asked you how much you can incline. Yeah, nobody asked how much you can incline press. It was all about how much you could barbell bench press. And so, and we know the law of specificity, the more I'm practicing barbell bench press, I'm gonna get better and better and better at that. So I'm just gonna focus on getting better at that. Meanwhile, ignoring the incline. And there was a time when I had a massive discrepancy. I mean, I could barely do 135 on the incline, but I'm pushing over 250 on the bench press. I had that much of a discrepancy between my incline and my flat bench. And then I went on a kick of just focusing on getting that incline up and it shot up my, my, my bench press. So there's huge value, uh, in, in focusing on the incline bench and don't avoid it or make it like the, Oh, every once in a while I do it because you're not good at it. Like get good at it. Same thing with the dumbbell varieties, right? Dumbbell chest presses got obvious carryover yes. uh, to the bench press. And then another one is, uh, dips. Heavy dips. I know, Justin, you talk about this. All yeah, the time. this, this was very enlightening for me. And two, and I was taking a year of just focused training body weight. Um, I I tried everything I could with gravitational forces, with instability. Like, so I, I was working with suspension trainer and with like Olympic rings. And I started to try to work on dips, which is very difficult uh, to do dips with the rings. Uh, there's just so many factors of like having to stabilize uh, myself in space. And, and then also working on getting depth with that. And then once I started working on getting depth and really being able to generate force at the very bottom position, and drive my way back out. It was amazing the the tran how that transferred over to my bench press in terms of like where that sticking point is for the most part, where you don't have a lot of uh, uh, ability to generate forces at the very bottom. Right. And this is why you want to kind of bounce off your chest. And this is why you know a lot of people kind of get stuck down there at the very bottom. But if you can if you can grind and generate more force, the really low dips, uh, it's great great exercise to work on that. It's Heavy. also good for shoulder health. Yeah, so, so that's the, uh, yep. you know when if you go back to the things that we pointed out, right? Being able to uh, have a stable shoulder girdle, having a primed, warmed, uh, stable shoulder, uh, being able to take something through full range of motion. The dip really, a loaded dip really addresses all those things. It really does a really good job 
of of getting you strong uh, at all those positions and definitely what this was a later one for me right so again thinking back of like those aha moments or like when this really came together for me uh i never really did um heavy loaded dips i just I, if i ever did dips it was like a body weight thing that we would throw in there as a superset or like just an exercise i would do every once in a while to get a pump or if i was limited to equipment never did i ever like try and get like how strong could i get at dips and actually doing two to three reps like that just seems silly to me like why would i ever do mm -hmm. two to three reps for dips um, but boy, if you've never trained yourself like that before, like, man, let's see how much I can load and how much I can dip, uh, dip with, even to the point where I'm starting to train three, four reps at a time, just continually pushing the load, man, that carryover into digging out of a bench press, uh, huge, huge difference. Totally. And dips are interesting because they help you at the bottom of your bench. They also help you at the lockout. Yeah. The lockout. Yeah. Yeah. You do really good with dips That's at true. the top. You have to really lock your arms out and, and, and stay strong. You'll see that lockout because that's the other area. I'd say most common sticking point on a bench press is the bottom. Second would be lockout. And more advanced lifters tend to get messed up with the lockout. That's why you see a lot of power lifters training that lockout portion. Right. Dips uh, tend to help that uh, pretty well. Um, advanced techniques. Let's talk about maybe some advanced ways of getting your bench press to go up higher. Bands on the bar made a huge difference. Now they, they, you know, Mark Bell has a slingshot, which is very similar to mm -hmm. what a band will do. So people will use a slingshot, but man, I saw, I was so stuck for so long and just adding bands to the bar and bands. What they do is, you know, when you feel a band properly on a bench press, the bottom part of the bench press, you don't feel much resistance because as you stretch the band out, the resistance gets harder. Well, I'm also getting stronger as the bar moves up. So I'm getting resistance. That's kind of matching my strength curve. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. My, I added like 20 pounds of my bench press in such a short period of time from, from using bands. It gives you help at, at just the right portions of the, of the lift, which is, it's an amazing tool. Uh, once you, you, especially like if you start hitting those sticking points and, and plateau a little bit, uh, to be able to increase weight, but give yourself just enough help uh, where your body just isn't producing that amount of force because, you know, there are those portions of the rep you do increase your strength. And so then it challenges that, uh, you know, portion of the rep uh, uh, very effectively with the bands. So I like using chains for how you guys are explaining around. Chains are my favorite to increase load as, as I get through the top of the bench press. I love bands for the speed training that you can get with bench press. Like, so I think there's, that's well, another. Well, because they don't flop around. Yeah. yeah. You can go fast with bands. Yeah. yeah. So chain, like typically if I'm chains, I'm going to, I'm going to load, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to put, I'm lifting heavy that day and I want to progressively get heavier and heavier through that lift. And so it's more like that. And then if it's a day where I'm like, I want to do speed, I'm going to put really, really light weight, but then I'm going to add bands to it. And I like doing speed yeah, stuff. Yeah, because then the bar doesn't fly out of your hands. Yes. Yeah, speed yeah. speed work with bench is really good. Now, what does it look like, by the way, speed work with a bench? You're not going down and up real fast. I've, I've seen people do this before. Yeah. They're like, oh, i got to practice speed. And they're like, diggity, diggity, diggity. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it, really what you want to do is you want to go down control, yeah, get resist, tight, and yeah. then come up. And now with the speed press, it's important to maintain that stable shoulder girdle. Because yeah. what you're going to want to do is roll your shoulders forward and if you're doing that with the speed bench, you're going to hurt yourself. Yeah. So it's be able to stay stable with the shoulder girdle and then push up. Stable, anchored, and controlled. So you still have to maintain control as you're moving fast. You only want certain parts of your body to move yes. like that. And then one that requires no additional equipment is just pausing the rep at different parts of the bench press, like pausing it at the bottom where it's like barely touching your chest or pressing up halfway, pausing yeah. for three seconds, and then pressing all the way up like – Pause reps are awesome because you don't need any additional equipment to make a rep more challenging in the p points that you need it to be more challenging with. So it's uh, in that same favorite. in that same space, you, uh, like floor presses are like that. Yeah, are like kind of like pause reps, only you're using the feedback from the floor that's actually supporting it. Kind of like where you take like bottoms up type of squats. I think yeah. there's a lot of value in that, especially if you have that sticking point, right? Digging out of the hole. You can control the weight down really well, but then from the, that coming out, like if you come from a dead stop, it's really tough to do that. You have to learn to really put yourself in a really good position to be able to get out. Also switch over to kilograms. And, uh, <laughs> so you don't really to, know what so, weight it is. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to throw that one in there yeah, as a that's sidebar. A, that's a good one. So there you have it. There's your bench press masterclass. Look, if you want more free information from Mind Pump, 
Go to mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. Justin is at mindpumpjustin. Adam's at mindpumpadam. And I'm at mindpumpdestefano. 